Panel, are we ready? Da, 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 da. The panel. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the purpose of this panel is to bring some ideas that are empowering, uh, ideas from people that are in the field. This conference, we have seen so many wonderful stories, and it was hard to find someone who actually don't have a conflict with flights. Uh, and a, a couple of our presenters, they had a flight conference, so they couldn't join us. There are so many wonderful stories that we have heard in the different uh, mini sessions. And we selected some of those that represent different uh, contexts and different populations. And basically, uh, here I have some people that are doing wonderful things in their communities. They are uh, considered um, people that are uh, making things uh, happen uh, in whatever the odds and things uh, uh, that they are living in their uh, communities. So, uh, my invitation, if we can, we can like, we would like to focus on the, the goals of this conference, and with the Think Innovators, we got a taste of that. Here's another taste of the goals of uh, the conference. So I invited my guests to think about one of these goals, how the wonderful things that they do uh, represent uh, the spirit that they have. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to read their bios. Their bios are online in our website. But some of the things that represent what they are doing. So we will start with the person that worked with the very young uh, children, Kiria Kim and Liu. Uh, she's a kindergarten educator in Piraeus, Greece, a community that has been, a hit by has been hit by poverty and unemployment, and has significant needs seen its demog uh, demographic change in cultural terms due to the massive influx of immigrants. Since she started her PhD, she has focused her research on the use of educational technology to provide low-income kindergarten students with the set and skills that are essential for our complex world. Work has been awarded by European Commission, the Council of Europe, and the Greek Ministry of Education. I'm not going to stand on that because of the interest of the time, but I'm going to let her talk how she has, uh, how she had been able to accomplish so many wonderful things uh, in all uh, this environment. Thank you so much. I feel really honored to be among these inspiring people that have been able to make the difference in their communities. So, So, uh, in kindergarten, we like to say stories. So today, I'm going to tell you a story, a story of change. In a rapidly changing world, some things remain unchanged. This is the first thing that came to my mind in September of 2012, when I entered the school of Kaminia, a disadvantaged district of Piraeus, Greece. The school principal welcomed me in his office. Here, he said, the economic crisis and the massive migration movement have so deeply impacted the normal function of society that it is difficult to determine if and when things will return to normal. The teachers sitting in the office seemed quite concerned. Only five months after the second memorandum on financial assistance to Greece, the drastic cuts over 40% in teachers' salaries the entire educational system had made many of my colleagues, including myself, feeling insecure and uncertain. The parents in Piraeus shared the same view, feeling that the younger generation had become a lost generation that didn't have much to dream about apart from a future of austerity. These attitudes had passed on to the children. As a result, most of the kindergarten students that I met in the low-income communities of Piraeus exhibited anxiety and low self-esteem. And although the 21st century calls for a generation of globally competent individuals, the equity in global competence education in the public school of Piraeus seemed to remain an unchanged problem. But wait a minute, 
Isn't there always two sides to every story? The crisis has definitely had a devastating impact on education. Then again, as Henry Giroux argues, education always presupposes a vision for the future. A vision that could lift the society out of the crisis. Aiming to embrace a different way of thinking about the crisis, I came across a very interesting paper by Simons and Marshallin where the unemployed and the poor were not perceived as those who need additional income, but rather as those who need additional learning. This perception made me take a deliberate stance of hopefulness and see the crisis as a one-of-a-kind opportunity to adopt learning as a tool for exploring the possibility of change in my low-income community. Having developed a great respect for Project Zero research work around thinking and learning, I took courage and wrote to a person that I always admired but never had met before, the mastermind behind learning in and through the arts, Dr. Shari Tishman. In my email, I was asking her to help me exploring ways of integrating frameworks such as artful thinking and visible thinking in the low-income kindergarten schools of Pireus. I couldn't believe my eyes when the next day I read her answer, offering a more other things to bring me into contact with a person that has connected her name and research work to authentic and meaningful learning in early childhood education. And this person is no other than the chair of ICA 2018, Dr. Angela Sun. Being committed herself to bringing positive change Angela Salman became my mentor, who greatly supported me in fulfilling my vision to implement progressive ideas in early childhood settings that aim to bring out the potential in every student. Due to her constructive guidance, I was able to integrate Project Zero frameworks into my PhD research and investigate the interplay between those frameworks and educational technology. As a result, I developed a number of projects where low-income young students would use technology such as digital comics to make visible and communicate their views of equity and inclusion as experienced in their uh, daily lives in school. Three of these projects participated in international competitions and were awarded for major contribution to citizenship and human rights education by the European Commission, the Council of Europe and the Greek Minister of Education. Change, however, is a process that Salmon feeds neatly into a single cycle. So in 2014, a new cycle of change begins as I become the first Greek educator that joins Project Zero's Out of a Learn project. It was that year that I met Dr. Liz Jones to Rising, the person who actually slowed down to observe carefully our work and listen to our stories. Out of a Learn gave the previously marginalized students and their families of my community an equal opportunity to take action and be heard in our interconnected world. I feel extremely grateful to the directors of the Out of Inner Learn projects, Shari Tishman, Liz Dose Rising and Carrie James, for having my low-income class being featured in the second Glipsis video from within the Out of Inner Learn classrooms, that in turn led the Mayor of Piraeus and the Ministry of Education in Greece to promote our work through the national media and press as an exemplar of teaching practice that can transform learning in disadvantaged communities. Aiming to share the project's potential with Greek educators who are committed in changing their schools, I founded the Out of Eden Learn Teachers of Greece official Facebook community that has so far reached more than 700 members across the country and has been associated with a number of studies in collaboration with the University of Western Macedonia. The experience and knowledge that I gained through my collaboration with such inspiring people like Shari, Angela and Liz led me to design Philoxenos, that means hospital, an innovative project under the auspices of the Greek section of Amnesty International that incorporates Project Zero's ideas and aims to engage students of different shades, socioeconomic backgrounds and ethnic groups in effective global problem solving and in respect for cross-cultural inquiry and exchange. Philoxenos was piloted this year by four extremely creative and passionate teachers and I'm so happy that one of them is in the room today and this is my friend and best working partner, Kaliopi Nikolopoulou. So, standing here in front of you today brings to my mind how I used to think about the things that remain unchanged in low-income communities like the one where I come from. But if you ask me how I now think, I will tell you 
the process of change is not about the school environment, but about our perspectives. As Mahatma Gandhi says, if you want to change the world, start with yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kiriaki. We will give some room uh, at the end to ask questions. On. Now, my next guest is um, Natalie Belay. Natalie uh, Belay, her practice is in the United States uh, in public school. Uh, she lives in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Uh, as a, so, uh, the people who live here in the United States will know that the standardized testing is something that uh, Give us a lot of trouble to bring many of these wonderful ideas to practice, but not only doesn't know uh, the word bar barriers, she's a risk taker and she does all kinds of things with her students. Uh, she's very transdisciplinary in her teaching. Uh, her students are in love with her and I have visited her community uh, a few times. And I can tell you that that community should change the name to not only the lies community, there are students from different generations that are there inspired by Natalie. They are always going back to see her. You can believe children in the summer, the beautiful weather, lining up for her book clubs, starting from fourth grade to high school. And then they go back once they graduate and they want to continue learning from Natalie. So I'm going to leave Natalie share with us how she did that. I'm not sure what to say after that. <laughs> um, but one of the things that um, I have found with students is um, they want to be heard, they want to be listened to. Um, they know when we're just doing our job and we're just a fixture in the classroom. Um, they know um, when we show up um, and it's just to kind of show up to get somebody through the next task the next activity um, or to monitor them at recess. Um, so my approach is, is slightly different. Um, I am kind of the rebel in the classroom. Um, the students have made a big poster outside of my room saying, welcome to Mrs. Belli's classroom. Comfortable conversations about uncomfortable situations. Um, they've also um, dubbed our reading clubs, our book clubs, as the willing to be disturbed <laughs> book clubs because oftentimes we talk about pretty edgy and sensitive issues and I have um, watched and seen how um, kids, kids want to be discussing things um, that sometimes they don't know how to discuss with their parents or maybe their parents are not available or their parents have a sense of um, protecting their, their kids from current events or situations in their own lives. And I think um, the other way, I think sometimes we tend to overprotect, and I feel that kids need to be engaged in some of these issues in a, in a sensitive way, but also to gain deeper perspectives and understanding of, of things. Um, and I try to create spaces for that. Um, you know, by looking at my classroom from a from a visual standpoint, you might walk in and say, you know, I don't see like a lot of diversity here perhaps, um, but these kids show up with a plethora of complex um, experiences and situations um, that might not be privy to us on, on the outside. And when we can sit and listen and talk and cry and laugh, um, and oftentimes I think, me personally, um, share our own vulnerabilities because oftentimes we ask students to share so much about themselves but we're really hesitant to share ourselves. Um, I shared in my session um, the other day that um, one of the ways for me to really connect to my kids at the very beginning of the year is through embarrassing stories and I have so many embarrassing stories myself and things happen to me on a daily basis. Um, but I have the kids go home to their parents and I have them collect their parents' embarrassing story or a story from their childhood to share with detail and of course I share a few of my 
embarrassing stories first as that model. But you'll see kids going back to their parents over and over saying, I need more detail. You, you need to give me more information. That was too general. I need to hear more about your embarrassing story. And what's fabulous for me is when the teachers then, I mean, the parents come back to my classroom for conference, I know them from their embarrassing story, and so we're creating relationships too, and um, it's, it's fabulous. Um, one of the best embarrassing stories that actually came from a parent was um, in a kindergarten class. She had just returned from Iceland, and she was, this is when kids could have candy or chocolate or cupcakes in the classroom, and now because of allergies and you name it, um, I have to design my projects as science projects past the nurse's office in order to get in sometimes. But in this particular situation, um, this parent's embarrassing story was she showed up coming back from Iceland and she had chocolates for the kindergarten kids and she was so excited that um, everybody wanted the chocolate. They loved the chocolate and some kids even had two pieces of chocolate. So that night when she came home, she said, I'm, I'm going to have a piece of chocolate. I'm going to my chocolate now, and when she bit into it, she realized that it was filled with vodka. And she had, like, and she had given out chocolates with vodka in it, and she's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be kicked out of this school. Thank goodness it was a small kindergarten classroom. <laughs> but these are these embarrassing stories that kind of come back in here, and, and I will always remember that parent because she's made me feel better about a lot of situations when she shared that story with me. Um, and I never had to bring any, any dessert to my classroom either. Um, but through our stories and through the power of stories, I think that um, we have an opportunity to be closer to kids, be developing relationships with parents and students. And um, one of the ways that I'm able to do that is through these book clubs, these summer book clubs, where these are kids that it's the last day of school and, and they want to come back. And I'll have about 70, 80 kids, all different ages, coming to the living room of my home and sitting and having 90-minute clubs um, and talking about subjects that you know we might not be entering, um, from police brutality, um, you know, and to gun control and some of the issues that we've talked about here. We're talking with them about this with 11-year-olds, 10-year-olds, as well as the 16 and the 18-year-olds. Um, so that's the part that's really fabulous. And then from those book clubs and from those relationships, I've watched these kids go on to be leaders in their community, um, advisors for them in, in the college realm, um, giving portfolio advice to. But on top of it, they're change makers in their own community. And so many parents now are coming to these groups saying, we have a problem and we'd like to present this problem, kind of like Think Novators. And we would like your group of kids to try to come up with some solutions because we've seen them making differences in the community. Um, and that's pretty special. So I just feel really fortunate to be a teacher and to actually have these relationships with these students. So thank you. Now I'd like to, uh, uh, to present uh, Paula Pongrain. She's another uh, pollinator and she pollinates wonderful ideas in South America. Uh, she's, she works in teacher preparation, and, um, but in different areas. So she tries uh, to teach the uh, faculty from different areas, chemistry, architecture, business, uh, in ways to teach with the teaching for understanding framework. Uh, and she's also consulted with many ministries uh, in, throughout Latin America. She's also founder of Latitude Zero to unite people uh, across the continent, and I guess we're thinking Spain or something like that. So I'm going to let Paula tell her story. Thank you very much, and it's an honor for me to be here. Um, I need to ask you to excuse me for my uh, for speaking in English because for two reasons. First of all, because my English is not good. And second, because I know that there is many people here that speak Spanish, and, but as we don't have the, the double translation, I need to speak in English. That's why I have, like, and you are going to understand me, a machete. Um, for more than three decades, 
and have been simultaneously involved in the, in the diversity of roles and responsibilities in the educational systems in, at different levels. I have worked as, um, as a head in a school, and I am a professor and researcher at the university. And I have also the opportunity as a public official in the National Ministry of Education in my country, Argentina, and in other Latin American countries, and at the UNESCO, to help to develop educational public policies. The most recent challenge extended to a regional scope because I have the opportunity to direct the Mercosur Educational Support Program, which is called PASEM. This opportunity to develop my profession in so many environments gave me the broader perspective and areas of influence. But a crucial point has been when in 1994, thanks to Veronica boltzmann Sisha, I met Project Zero. Since then, my perspective, my activities have been inspired by these ideas. After six years of intense and rich collaboration, uh, inspired with many people there, Patricia, David, Ron Richard, Daniel Wilson, Chris Sanger, many of them, um, we launched Latitude, the Latin American initiative towards understanding and development. Our Nodo Sur, based in Buenos Aires, has defined a clear mission. We promote the right for an inclusive education for all. We believe that this right, this human right, can only be achieved by improving teaching and creating cultures of thinking in schools and communities. For that purpose, we promote collaboration and alliances between the public and the private sector. We collaborate with schools working with leaders and teachers from kindergarten to university in Argentina and across the region in order to transform teaching and improve learning. Latitude Nodo Sur supports schools and communities networks, but also works as a network itself, gathering more than 30 professionals from very diverse areas of knowledge. And this diversity gives us the possibility to craft interdisciplinary responses to different needs. We foster not only school king, they are part of a broader communities with initiatives as visible thinking with Angela, and with Empecemos in Spain. For the past last 10 years, we have also focused on higher education, including teaching, training. We have held three international symposiums of teaching for understanding for university and higher education. More than 300 universities and teacher colleges got together to share good practices. Even beyond, Latitud Nodo Sur has influenced and enriched my research and my contributions to public policies in countries as Ecuador, Peru, Nicaragua, Uruguay, Brazil, and Argentina. Nowadays, I'm firmly involved in teaching for understanding in higher education, since I'm fully convinced that transforming university classrooms will lead to a more and better we lead to more and to better graduates, able to be a, a, a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Paola. Okay, now, it's my pleasure to introduce Jao Talreja, and I'll start with the little card that he just shared with me. It's Empowered for Life. Jao is the founder of Dream a Dream, Is a Dream a Dream, a registered charitable trust with empowering children and young people from vulnerable 
backgrounds to overcome adversity and flourish in the 21st century using a creative life skills approach. Currently, they work with uh, 10,000 young children in two innovative uh, labs. I'm not going to uh, explain that because I'd like to give uh, Michal the uh, voice to share all these wonderful stories and all the lives that he's touching with his work. Thank you, Angela. You know, I'm probably standing between us and getting home, getting to our flights. Um, Dream Dream has been around for about 18 years, based in a city called Bangalore, which is in the south of India. Uh, as Angela said, we work with children who come from difficult backgrounds. To just put you in context, we have about 300 million children in India. 160 million of those grow up in poverty. 48 million children of those are stunted, which is the highest number of stunted children anywhere in the world. The next highest number is in Nigeria with 10 million. India is sitting on a very unique challenge and a big crisis because we are also the country with the largest number of young people in the world. How do you actually even understand and respond to the complexity of a crisis like this? It's quite overwhelming and it almost leads to doing nothing. We chose to do something about it. What we chose to do is work with children who come from difficult backgrounds and create transformative experiences in their life. A transformative experience is something that we remember for life. Experience that gives us strength. An experience that gives us a way forward. We all remember our own teachers from school who left a deep positive impact. We don't remember all of our interactions with them. We probably remember one or two interactions that left a deep impact on them. We have explored some of those aspects here. You know, when Guy Claxton talked about the body, uh, a transformative experience which builds a body memory, a muscle memory. When we talk about language and articulation, a transformative experience gives meaning to our life. And I'll kind of deconstruct that and close it with that. Uh, I met this young girl uh, called Pallavi when she was 14 years old. She joined our uh, after-school program where we used to teach football to the kids. She's not a great football player, but she loved coming to the sessions. She enjoyed making friends, but she was extremely quiet. Uh, when she turned 18, she reached out to Dream and Dream and she said, uh, you know, I want to take this experience back to other kids in my community. I want to become a life skills facilitator at Trimetry. So we took her on board, she became a football coach and a life skills facilitator, but she's still a very average facilitator. But experiences in her life continue to build her resilience, build her agency. Last year, and, and I heard this story just a few months back, but last year she went back to the community where she grew up in, became a facilitator in the school where she studied. She realized that when she was a kid, because the community was largely underdeveloped, there were a lot of free spaces for children to play in. But as development caught up in the city, those free spaces had disappeared. So kids in her community had no place to. We're talking about over 10,000 kids living in that neighborhood. So over a period of six months, Alavi went and met school principals, she met community leaders, she met the local politicians, she met a local philanthropist, all men, and Pallavi is all of 20. And went and negotiated with them about creating a place for children. She was told off. She said, no, it's not possible, you know, and you're too young to understand these things. She didn't give up, she persevered. She continued in that journey till she finally found people beginning to listen to her. She found a private property. She found the owner of this private property, which was undeveloped. She managed to convince him to give this piece of private land as a play space for children till he gives it up for development. She got a local philanthropist who came in on board and said, I'll help you clean up this space. Within three months, using 
volunteers from the community, her own peers from the community, using parents and young young children in the community, she got the place clean. She created a beautiful football field for children. And she called me up one morning at eight o'clock in the morning, and she said, "Come over, we are inaugurating something. We're starting something new." And I had no clue all this was going on. I landed up there, and I see nine men on stage opening up this play space with a thousand children around. Bali was in the background. She had created this shift in the community, and all these nine men were praising what Pallavi had done for the community. So the way we are tackling the problem of 160 million children growing up in poverty in India is building their own agency, building the skills and capacities that they need to become change makers in their communities. Today, Pallavi on her own, without any support from my organization, has impacted the lives of 10,000 kids in her neighborhood. Imagine the power of that if 10,000 kids that we work with unlock their agency in their communities. Very soon, we'll be able to impact 160 million children. That's what we're trying to do uh, through our organization, Dream Dream. Thank you. All of these are wonderful stories, inspiring stories that makes us think that there are there's no limit if you have a dream, if you have a dream and, and uh, an invitation for all of us to dream. But now we are running short in time, uh, but uh, if you want to make questions, ask questions or have the, a conversation, uh, once that we uh, close the conference, uh, you're welcome to do that, if that's okay with you. With, with the rain, we had to uh, change some of our chronogram today. A little bit. But thank you so much for all those inspiring stories and for making the difference. Hey, nos grabas si no desde aquí. Tienes aquí un. Okay, thank you very much. Now.